This afternoon I'd like to discuss tobacco hawk moths. The scientific name is Manduca sexta. They're a moth of the sphingid family. The sphingidae are present through much of the American continent. Some people can mistake these moths that fly usually in the late afternoon or early evening for hummingbirds. They can eat on the wing. Uh, they can take nectar from flowers that are very deep. They have long tongues or proboscis. The species was first described by Carl Linnaeus in his 1763 Centuria Insectorum. They're commonly known as tobacco hawk moths as adults and the tobacco hornworm or the goliath worm as larvae. They can also be sold uh, as reptile food. They are closely related to and often confused with the very similar tomato hornworm. Both species feed on the foliage of various plants of the family Solanaceae. The larvae of these species can be distinguished by the lateral markings on either side. Tomato hornworms have eight V-shaped white markings with no borders. In contrast, tobacco hornworms have seven white diagonal lines with a black border. Additionally, tobacco hornworms have red horns at the back. Some people describe these as tails, while tomato hornworms have dark blue or black horns or tails. A mnemonic to remember the markings is tobacco hornworms have straight white lines like cigarettes, tobacco, cigarettes, while tomato hornworms have V-shaped markings as in vine-ripened tomatoes. Manduca sexta has mechanisms for selectively sequestering and secreting the neurotoxin nicotine present in tobacco. They can emit this when disturbed from their spiracles. They have a short life cycle lasting about 30 to 50 days. In most areas, there are about two generations a year, but there can be three or four generations per year in warm areas like Florida or California. They're, these are large green larvae, and, and uh, they can grow to a striking size of about 70 millimeters in length. Under laboratory conditions, when fed on a wheat germ-based diet, sort of a gelatinous diet, usually at the bottom of a cup, the larvae are turquoise due to a lack of pigments in their diet. Manduca sexta hemolymph, or blood, contains the blue-colored protein insecticyanin. When the larva feeds on plants, it ingests pigmentaceous carotenoids. The carotenoids are primarily yellow. The resulting combination is green. These larvae, as can be seen, are feeding on plants and not the laboratory diet, so they're more green in color. Housing the larvae as they grow in size can be a little bit problematical, but plastic tubs, particularly used to house various foods, can be repurposed, particularly if you use a layer of paper towel or blotter paper at the bottom of the cage. It's important to do this because the blotter paper absorbs water. The larvae need a fair amount of humidity to grow properly, but too much and they risk drowning or mold problems. Even so, the paper should be changed once a day. During the larval stage, Manduca sexta caterpillars feed on plants of the family Solanaceae, principally tobacco, tomato, and members of the genus Datura, or Jimson weed. Of course, t the tomatoes are a very broad family of plants, so you can not only use tomatoes as well as tomato foliage, but you can use potato. Very easy to get, very inexpensive. However, unlike the foliage, the potato contains a lot of water which again means you have to pay attention that the caterpillars do not drown. Near the end of the larval stage, the caterpillar seeks, seeks a location for pupation and burrows underground to pupate. The searching behavior is known as wandering. The eminence of pupation is suggested behaviorally by the wandering and can be anatomically confirmed by spotting the heart 
or aorta, which is a long pulsating vessel running along the lengths of the caterpillar's dorsal side. Here we look at these two larvae and we look at the dorsal side and we don't see any structure. Here are two prepupal caterpillars. They burrow underneath the paper in their tubs and they sometimes try to excavate a chamber. At this time they should be put on dirt where they can burrow into the dirt. It's clear with both examples they show the dorsal heart very clearly. They've also changed color so that they're a bit more yellowish. They've shrunk in size and they've lost their interest in light. All they want to do is burrow down into the earth and change. When the caterpillars enter the wandering phase, their behavior changes as well as their appearance. They no longer want to be around other individuals. They isolate themselves and here they're burrowing into moist earth in a tub. Some of them do this relatively quickly, others more slowly. The one in the corner is about halfway buried and these two are slowly burying themselves. It's important not to disturb them during this time because very soon they will enter the pupil phase. Lepidoptera are known for their distinctive stages in development. The caterpillar, the larval stage, the pupil, the resting stage, and the adult, the winged form. This is a prepupal individual. It is still green like the larva, but it is relatively quiescent. It doesn't move around much. It's not responsive to light, and in fact, it was recovered from its burrow. It was waiting. It was waiting to undergo distinct morphological change. An example is here, well on the way to a full pupa. A little bit of green is still evident. And here is the proboscis or tongue that is so important to these insects. There are also wings visible here and also distinct legs folded up here. Spiracles are visible as dots. This is a full pupa. It is still mobile. If disturbed, it can move around. But to people one or two hundred years ago, it may have been unclear how an insect starts off as something like a worm, then it would bury itself or enter a quiescent phase. It could form a cocoon and wait and then emerge as a butterfly, something totally different from what came before. Nature is usually known for its gradualism. However, insects undergo a dynamic transformation. In the 1830s, a German naturalist named Renus was arrested in Chile for heresy, as recorded in Darwin's journal during his voyage on the Beagle. I quote, Renus himself, two or three years before, left in a house at San Fernando some caterpillars under charge of a girl to feed, that they might turn into butterflies. This was ru rumored through town, and at last the padres and governor consulted together and agreed. It must be some heresy. Accordingly, when Renus returned, he was arrested. This doesn't suggest that no European understood what was going on, just perhaps that scientific literacy was not very high in the general population. Renus clearly understood that if you take worms, feed them a food plant, and let them develop, they will eventually turn into winged butterflies. Of course, some Europeans were well aware of insect metamorphosis from keeping bees. Humans have been collecting honey from the western honeybee for thousands of years. 
There's evidence from rock art found in France and Spain that dates to around 7000 BC. The ancient Egyptians depicted beekeepers on their tombs, so something of the life cycle of insects can be considered ancient knowledge. However, then as now, it seems as if scientific literacy was not widely distributed. This brings us to discuss the fossil evidence for insects and what the fossil record shows about insect development. The earliest insect forms showed direct development or a metabolism. Insects like this simply emerge from the egg as small adults and they get bigger. There is a size change over time. There's not a form change. The evolution of metamorphosis in insects is thought to have fueled their dramatic radiation. And again, the fossil evidence showed when this took place, both in terms of the insects and the fossil leaves that show chewing. Some early ametabolous true insects are still present today such as bristletails and silverfish. These funny little creatures, again, simply get bigger with age. They don't undergo any metamorphosis. Hemimetabolous insects include cockroaches, grasshoppers, dragonflies, and true bugs. Phylogenetically, all insects in the Terragota undergo a marked change in form texture and physical appearance from immature to adult stages. These insects either have hemimetabolous development and undergo incomplete or partial metamorphosis, in which case they have an immature stage and an adult stage, or holometabolous development, which undergo complete metamorphosis which includes a pupil or resting stage between the larval and adult forms. A good example are, of course, the Lepidoptera, which have a pupil stage. In 2018, researchers working in Germany have unearthed the earliest known fossil evidence of insects from the order Lepidoptera, or butterflies and moths. The paper is available online and it's titled, A Triassic Jurassic Window into the Evolution of Lepidoptera. The fossils, mostly wing scales, provide important insights into the Lepidopterans' evolutionary history, which has been unclear to date. Recovered were 70 wing scales and scale fragments from a drilled core in northern Germany, and a lot of information was extracted from these scales. They date from the Triassic-Jurassic boundary approximately 200 million years ago. Some of these wing scales showed characteristics of living Clasata, moths with, with a sophisticated sucking feeding device known as a proboscis, or basically uh, like a little motor-powered tongue that can suck things up very effectively. Glossatin moths mostly feed on angiosperms, plants that produce flowers, because the findings from this group suggest glossata may have originated earlier than angiosperms. However, Lepidopterans likely depended first on gymnosperms, which didn't produce flowers to satisfy their nutritional needs. It's likely they shifted later to angiosperms as a primary food source. The authors hypothesize a reason for the evolution of the sucking proboscis found in most Lepidopterans and replacing the chewing mouthparts of earlier lineages. The transition to exclusively feeding on liquids via the proboscis was most likely an evolutionary response to widespread heat and aridity during the late Triassic. 
Metamorphosis was so successful that today, as many as 65% of all animal species on the planet are metamorphosing insects. There's also a very interesting paper that deals with the tobacco hornworm specifically. And it's in 2008, available online. It's titled, Retention of Memory Through Metamorphosis. Can a moth remember what it learned as a caterpillar? This is more important than it may first seem because caterpillars would develop on a particular food plant and if they can keep the memory to the adult or winged phase, it would mean that the adult would be drawing upon a resource it learned as a caterpillar, particularly revolving around what food plants that it liked. Insects that undergo complete metamorphosis experience enormous changes in both morphology and lifestyle. The study examined whether larval experience can persist through pupation into adulthood and assesses two possible mechanisms that could underlie such behavior. Exposure of emerging adults to chemicals from the larval environment or associative learning transferred to adulthood via maintenance of intact synaptic connections. In the experiment, fifth instar Manduka sexta caterpillars received an electrical shock associatively paired with a specific odor in order to create a condition odor aversion. They were assayed for learning in a wide choice apparatus as larvae and again as adult moths. The author showed that larvae learned to avoid the training odor and that this aversion was still present in adults. The adult aversion did not result from carryover of chemicals from the larval environment as neither applying odorants to naive pupae nor washing the pupae of trained caterpillars resulted in a change in behavior. In addition, they report that larvae trained at third instar still showed odor aversion after two molts, the same as fifth instars, but did not avoid the odor as adults. This is a critical point. In other words, when trained earlier, they did not have the same aversion as adults, only when as trained fifth instar caterpillars. This is consistent with the idea that post-metamorphic recall involves regions of the brain that are not produced until later in larval development. The present study, the first to demonstrate conclusively that associative memory survives metamorphosis in Lepidoptera, provokes intriguing new questions about the organization and persistence of the central nervous system during metamorphosis. It suggests that even if the caterpillar might look the same from a third to fifth instar individual, in fact, it's undergoing enormous changes. The results have both ecological and evolutionary implications, as retention of memory through metamorphosis could influence host plant choice, habitat selection, and it could lead to eventual sympatric speciation. This is speciation taking place without geographical separation. There are certainly a lot more avenues of research, both in terms of behavior and in terms of the fossil record that await future generations. Metamorphosis carries with it incredible risks. Here is a larva happily eating a piece of potato. Many larvae that went before it did not make it to the pupil stage. They shrink and they die. This larva is halfway. The top part is still more larval, whereas the bottom part has successfully transitioned into the pupil phase. This is the end result, the pupil or resting phase. But the question is, 
why would a happy worm want to undergo an incredible transformation to enter into a pupal phase when the results are not guaranteed. Some indication of how and why this occurred in the distant past is presented by Hannah Ten Brink in the paper The Evolutionary Ecology of Metamorphosis. It's a fascinating topic that because soft parts like insects usually have aren't preserved well, there is a real lack of fossil evidence. You would need an incredible amount of fossil evidence to actually pinpoint why metamorphosis is such a popular option. And I'll read from the abstract. Almost all animal species undergo metamorphosis, even though empirical data show that this life history strategy evolved only a few times. Why is metamorphosis so widespread, and why has it evolved? Here we study the evolution of metamorphosis by using a fully size-structured population model in conjunction with adaptive dynamic approach. We assume that individuals compete for two food sources. One of these, the primary food source, is available to individuals of all sizes. The secondary food source is available only to large individuals. And we could say that for Lepidoptera, it might only be available to winged individuals. Without metamorphosis, unresolvable tensions arise for species faced with the opportunity of specializing on such secondary food sources. We show that metamorphosis can evolve as a way to resolve these tensions such that small individuals specialize on the primary food source while large individuals specialize on the secondary food source. We find, however, that metamorphosis evolves only when the supply rate of the secondary food source exceeds a high threshold. Individuals postpone metamorphosis when the ecological conditions under which metamorphosis originally evolved deteriorate, but will often not abandon this life history strategy even if it causes population extinction through evolutionary trapping. In summary, our results show that metamorphosis is not easy to evolve, but that, once evolved, it is hard to lose. These findings can explain the widespread occurrence of metamorphosis in the animal kingdom despite its few evolutionary origins. So perhaps insects undergo this metamorphosis as a result of deep history that presented a different set of challenges and that once it evolved, insects are loath to give it up. There are many other possible scenarios and the coming decades will no doubt present much better information as genetic studies come online. On the left is an empty pupil case and on the right is the moth that has emerged several hours before from the pupa. This is a natural place to talk about metamorphosis. Once the metamorphosis within the pupal case is completed, the butterfly or moth may remain at rest until the appropriate trigger signals the time to emerge. Changes in light or temperature chemical signals, or even hormonal triggers may initiate the adult's emergence. For this moth, an extended photo period and a higher temperature signals emergence. Insects emerge or eclose from the pupa by splitting the pupal case. In this case, the moth has split roughly the area where the wings are. The moth, when it is in the case, inflated the wings, split open the pupal case, and then sought out a vertical surface to help gravity 
inflate the wings. Most butterflies emerge in the morning. In this case, the moth emerged in the evening and it is now quiescent during the day. The adult, also called the amajo, emerges from its pupil cuticle with a swollen abdomen and shriveled wings. For the first few hours of its adult life, the butterfly or moth will pump hemolymph into the veins in its wings to expand them. The waste product of metamorphosis, a reddish liquid called meconium, will be discharged from the anus. This looks much like paint and some of it is still visible on the pupil case. If the wings harden in a few hours without being fully inflated, they will be deformed and the insect will not be able to fly. Once its wings are fully dried and expanded, the adult butterfly or moth can fly away in search of a mate and then lay eggs on the appropriate substrate. But this is a natural point to talk about why metamorphosis is so important for insects. The primary advantage of complete metamorphosis is eliminating competition between young, in this case caterpillars or worms, and old, in this case winged individuals. Larval insects and adult insects occupy a very different ecological niche and they have different foods. The winged adults may also disperse and find food plants some distance away from where they developed. This aids in the insect's conquest of a large territory. The Sphingidae are a family of moths commonly known as hawk moths, sphinx moths, and hornworms. It includes about 1,450 species. It is best represented in the tropics. They are moderate to large in size and are distinguished among moths for their rapid sustained flying ability. Their narrow wings and streamlined abdomens are adaptations for rapid flight. The hovering capability is only known to have evolved four times in nectar feeders. In hummingbirds, certain bats, hoverflies, and of course these sphingids. This is an example of convergent evolution. There's a good illustration from John Curtis's British Entomology Volume 5. This is perhaps the earliest British record for this species. John Curtis lived from 1791 to 1862 and his work is a good example of the scope and depth of Victorian scholarship. The artist in this case paid particular attention to structures even if they did not understand what those structures were. But back to our narrative. Sphingids have been much studied for their ability to move rapidly from side to side while hovering. This is called swing hovering or side slipping. This is thought to have evolved to deal with ambush predators that can lie in wait near flowers. Sphingids are some of the faster flying insects. Some are capable of flying at over 12 miles per hour. Most adults feed on nectar, although a few tropical species feed on eye secretions. And the famous death's head hawk moths, as known from many horror movies, steal honey from bees. Night flying sphingids tend to prefer pale flowers with long corolla tubes and a sweet odor. Some species are generalists, while other moth species are very specific. One plant might only be successfully pollinated by a particular species of moth. Orchids frequently have specific relations with specific hawk moth species. Many orchids can have long corolla tubes that are appreciated by humans and these tubes might only be accessible by a particular species of sphingid moth with a very long tongue. So even though 
tobacco hornworms and tomato hornworms might cause a lot of damage to plants of interest to humans, on the balance, they are an important part of the ecosystem. Thank you very much for your attention.